Well, as part of our series called The Rise of the New Normal, I explained this thing called the Secular Salvation Shema, and it originated with an uh, author, thinker, pastor that I respect and admire named Mark Sayers. He's out of Red Church in Melbourne, Australia. And if you're interested in more, I had the tremendous privilege of sitting down with Mark and having a conversation, something that we were supposed to have in person in Melbourne, but uh, COVID. So he and I got together uh, online one night and recorded this interview for my leadership podcast that we're happy to share with you here at Connexus Church. So enjoy this conversation with Mark Sayers. He deconstructs the secular salvation schema that we talked about in part two of the rise of the new normal in the early part of the interview. But then we go on to talk about the pandemic and shifting worldviews. I found it to be a fascinating conversation. So here it is. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Wonderful to be here. Yeah, we. Uh, I, I. I just want to start by saying thank you for all your work. We had. Uh, I was saying before we started recording. Uh, the first time we met in person, it was kind of awkward. We were in London together, and we were staying. I think at the same hotel. You were there with your family, and I knew who you were, and I had heard all about you, but I hadn't read your books at that point, or yet discovered um, this cultural moment. And so it was kind of one of those empty conversations where I had no good questions, and I went home and binged it. And have since met uh, John Mark Comer, and uh, you know we've connected in a couple of different ways. So it's just a thrill, and uh, I want to thank you on behalf of all leaders for the tremendous contribution you've made to the conversation. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So um, one of the things I think you are particularly gifted at is you have the ability to spot what I would call meta trends, or just you know the whole idea behind this cultural moment. You have an amazing ability to see what's going on, to name it, to call it, and to communicate it in a way that's clear. So we're here in the middle of the crisis. We were supposed to do this interview face-to-face -face a few days ago. Uh, my Australia trip wisely was canceled, and uh, you're in Melbourne, and I'm here in Toronto. Uh, but uh, what meta trends have been at play three weeks into this global crisis? Like, uh, I, I heard you in your own podcast, The Rebuilders, sort of touch on that, and I'd love you just to bring some of your thoughts into this moment? Yeah. Well, I, I had the sense that um, you know, a lot of my work for the last few years has been looking at uh, post-Christian you know, dynamic, particularly in the West. And I think there was a sense around church leaders, uh, cultural leaders, business leaders that uh, coming from a faith background, that there was this post-Christian dynamic that was at play, that it sort of caught up with us very quickly. Um, so a lot of my work's been around that. But I think probably a year ago, six months ago, I realized that I had this sense that post-Christianity and the West was about to be disrupted by globalization. This sense that as the world became more connected, it became more diverse. And um, that, you know, what does it look like when we're intimately connected to China? What does it look like when India, you know, rises, a billion, uh, over a billion people, you know, rising? And uh, what does it look like when we move sort of beyond which, what's been the American century into more of a true globalized century? And so, you know, I was just starting to postulate what would that all look like? Part of the beginning of this later season of uh, this cultural moment, which we've paused because in a sense it's jumped ahead of where we were was, you know, my, my bet that post-Christianity was about to get severely disrupted just at the moment we were starting to just really grapple with it. And so I see this, uh, you know, virus which has come out of Wuhan um, as an evidence of the the lack of resilience that this global connected uh, ideology really, in a sense that we thought if we just connect everything in the world, um, things will get better. And indeed they have. There's been a, a big uptake in people moving out of poverty in places like China and India. But in the midst of it as well, there was this tremendous weakness. Um, all it takes is one virus to shut everything down. And we're now living in the consequences of that. And, you know, I think that this is a profound switch. We've been uh, at a moment where we've never, ever had the entire world focused on one issue. We've become a one issue world at the moment. Um, so I just see this as an incredible once in a century moment, to be honest. And I think this is going to be profoundly change the world. Not everything will stop. You know, things will carry, there'll be things that carry on as per normal. But I think this is a definite sort of inflection point for the world. I think it was a surprise. And I mean, you can see, uh, you know, the movie Outbreak or Pandemic or, or things like that. And people always have this dystopian future. But I do think this caught everybody off guard. 
before the whole coronavirus uh, sort of emerged as a story, where were you thinking it would go? And where did you suspect, how did you suspect we might get disrupted? And uh, I'd just be curious as to where you imagined it might go. Yeah, so I think particularly the American century has been defined by the American story. And, um, you know, the United States has been the preeminent global power since the end of World War II and probably, you know, somewhere, but, you know, took over really from the United Kingdom and Europe. Um, and a lot of that story was an inward story. Um, the story in the world was defined by increasingly a political polarization between left and right, uh, which followed, I guess, the American pattern of politics. And I felt like, you know, what does it look like with the China rising? I began to study China more and more. Um, you had a China which was coming out of what it saw of a century of humiliation and wanted to be a global player in the world. It had a grand project under the premiership of Xi Jinping, which is called the Belt and Road Project, which was to connect the world, to reinvigorate the Silk Roads, which had given it power uh, in, you know, uh, when it was the middle kingdom of the world. Uh, you know, and I thought this is going to disrupt um, the West. Uh, what does it look like when I think we'd. We'd almost bought this myth in many Western countries that, hey, there was this, this person who out there who's unchurched and they're all super progressive. They all think of something similar. They're all very postmodern and very secular. And that's the new. So they live in, in Portland, basically, with John Mark, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Um, but I just began to notice this didn't tally with what I experienced on the street. You know, like I would talk to someone and it could be an Iranian uh, refugee who's come to Melbourne, who's, you know, wrestling with what's happened to their country and, and you know, Islam and, you know, uh, questioning it all. Or it could be someone who'd grown up with a Catholic background and how do they, you know, the, uh, am I religious? Am I not? There was just so much more diversity than what the big story was telling us. So I felt the diversity was going to undermine um, I think this sort of polarity where the church had been stuck in this political question between left and right. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. And, you know, the other perspective you have, because I have visited Australia three times before this trip was shut down, and we plan to do it again in 2021 now, God willing. Uh, but you pay much more attention to Asia than we do in North America. I mean, if you think about it, your your vacation is in Bali or you head to Malaysia or something like that. And I think here in our part of the Western world, we just don't think in those terms. It seems very, um, yeah, very distant. And so you would see much more of a global culture perhaps than, and, and probably a different slice of it than you would in New York or Toronto. Yes. I mean, and I think the change is like, you know, traditionally when Australia had migration, people would come here right. and we've had people come all over the world. In a sense, it was, you know, you're leaving your, your old world behind, but the connectivity of this moment is fascinating. So I live in an area which is um, heavily influenced by, um, uh, you know, people from mainland China. And what's interesting is starting to see the influence of, you know, the politics of mainland China come here, even in my local neighborhood. Um, you know, we had the Chinese, uh, you know, flag flying over our police station. And, um, yeah, there was this moment where there was the rainbow flag was flying on lots of civic buildings around mm -hmm. the world. And so we then had that, you know, at the police station. But then it was interesting. So you had representatives say, hey, we want our culture represented as well. So all of a sudden during the Hong Kong protests at our local police station here in, you know, in Box Hill in Australia, you had the Chinese flag flying and you had it over our town hall. And then you had people who were backing the Hong Kong protests in this area saying, hang on, what's going on? And I saw that and I thought, this is a disruption. Mm -hmm. And so I think here in Australia, we've been more attuned to the fact of seeing the rising power of Asia. And it's not just China, it's India, it's, it's Singapore, it's Japan, it's South Korea. My daughter, um, it's just normal for her to listen to pop music from South Korea. Like I grew up listening to music. Yeah, it's just like, oh, is this, you know, she doesn't see it as world music or anything. It's just like, you know, what was listening to American music, all the bands she listens to are from South Korea or they're from Norway. And, you know, it's this increasingly diverse world. And I think that's going to come to America increasingly. I think America's still thinking about this as, oh, what does it look like to have a multicultural internal national debate? But what does it look like when you're just one player in a vast chessboard of different pieces playing a game on the global stage? So when you're 300 million people out of 7 point something billion people, how does that change the equation? Yes. And then suddenly nobody would have predicted this. Nobody in January would have said all the borders will be shut down. International travel will grind to a halt. The economy will collapse, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so now, you know, people are talking about deglobalization, which perhaps we can come back to uh, toward the end. But I want to probably my favorite episode and perhaps the favorite thing that I listened to in 2019 last year was the episode on this cultural moment where you unpacked secular salvation, the secular salvation schema. So John has done this. John Mark has done this on this uh, podcast a couple of months ago. He tried to, he said he was trying to channel you, <laughs> paraphrase you. I would love for you to unpack that for us. Give us the the five minute version of secular salvation, because I would, I think it has disrupted that paradigm as well and would love to explore that with you. Yeah. I mean, one of my theories is that when we speak about post-Christian culture, a lot of people initially spoke about it as, oh, we've returned to this, you know, ground zero, that the slate has been wiped clean and, you know, we're back in the first century. Um, And where no one's ever heard the story of Jesus. But really, post-Christian culture is advancing some of the elements of Christian culture, but minus the lordship of Jesus Christ. I say it's the kingdom without the king. And that plays out in multiple different ways. But one way I realize that it plays out is in particularly this individual life plan or trajectory, which we expect, um, which actually has contours of the Christian story over it, but it's actually secularized. So, uh, you know, if you think about the Christian story, the Christian gospel is that humans are fallen and uh, we've rebelled against God, uh, cast out of the garden, always wandering east of Eden. Um, And then, you know, we have Jesus who comes into the world, incarnates, dies on the cross. And when we bow to him and follow him, accept him into our lives, you know, he then offers us salvation. So there's this secularized version of that. And it sort of looks like there's some kind of brokenness. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's almost multiple versions of the secular story. But I'll just give you like, let's give you the most probably popular one. Uh, You know, here is um, this particular guy and he's grown up in a really tough circumstances and it's been really difficult. And but then he, despite everyone else in his community struggling, he looked and he saw something inside of him and it was a self-belief. And there was a talent link to that. Maybe he's a musician. Maybe he's a basketball player. Maybe he's an incredible architect or an IT entrepreneur. And so cutting out the voices around him, he then commits to this discipline and he cherishes his his thing. And he has these breaks because he believes in himself. And then eventually he is gloried as he reaches this point of achievement and gains fame and ascends to this position of sainthood and glorification as he's recognized for the incredible person that he really is, gains the adulation of his peers, and then he appears on Oprah's couch and tells this story, and all clap and and smile and cry as he's followed the secular salvation story. Mm. Um, So there's this sense where there's a redemptive, there was a book called The Redemptive Self, which said that what the United States has done is it's taken this Christian story but then it's applied it to lives. And there's a secular running of that, which yet yeah, mirrors the Christian story of redemption. So the fall is often obscurity. The fall in this version may be hiddenness. It may be brokenness. It may be addiction. It may be poverty. Um, but the salvation's not outside of ourselves. It's actually truly believing in who you are. Um, it's truly loving yourself. And it's gaining some sort of... Um, you know, often it's talent and achievement and then achieving that and then becoming almost a saint, a secular saint in your, your field. Sainthood is celebrity when you're recognized by your peers. Um, there's another one I'll just quickly share as well, which is almost a, another story where it's, it's almost subverts the Christian one, which is the person who grew up perhaps in a religious family, which was strict and maybe they grew up in a, in a fundamentalist Christian or Hasidic Jewish or Islamic. And, and then they slowly stripped themselves of those things, which is like sin. And then they discovered who they really are and running away from those strictures of culture. They then walked into this experience and they were able to taste all the fruit of the garden for themselves. And now they live in this happiness and live in this kingdom of God on heaven, heaven that's come down to earth. And they they travel and they experience everything that the world has to offer. There's some versions of the secular salvation schema. And what is the reward in secular salvation where you've removed God, you've got the kingdom, but you've got no king? What would uh, a typical reward be? I would say adulation or celebrity. Another one would be pleasure living a life which is continually pleasurable. I would say they're the two main ones. And the The other lifestyle entrepreneurship thing is an expression of that. Right. Um, And perhaps glory, power, and knowledge. Right. 
And and I think, uh, correct me, this may not have been you, but I'm pretty sure I heard you at one time point say it's freedom as well. The freedom to do what you want, when you want, where you want, how you want. And one of the reasons I thought that was so salient now is what have we lost over the last 30 days? We've lost our freedom. We've lost autonomy. We've lost... Um, mobility. We've lost predictability. We've, you know, not only seen net worth drop or income drop or unemployment rise, uh, but that whole idea that I am the master of my own fate seems to have been just snatched from us overnight. I'd love to hear you, first of all, comment on that. And secondly, expand on that or, or, or correct that if, uh, if I'm taking it in the wrong direction. No, absolutely. I, 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 you know, realized that what Western culture was doing primarily and increasingly non-Western culture was offering us more freedom. Right. So to be a human, you actually do need some level of freedom. So, for example, someone who is currently living in North Korea, they need more freedom. Someone yes. who's in yeah. prison, you know, for their for their political beliefs um, with a you know, dictatorship needs more freedom. Um, but there's a point where freedom goes into beyond where there's an appropriate level into uh, almost a, ty a tyranny of freedom. So humans need freedom, but we also need community and we all, you know, a social fabric in mm -hmm. which to live, to find ourselves in other people and to be loved and be known by them. But also we need meaning. So what the West has done is it's delivered us a lopsided version of those needs where we have increasing freedom. We can download what we want on Netflix. We can, as you said, travel where we want. You know, we can take a, a cheap flight to Bali. You know, we can uh, reinvent ourselves in any way we want. We can, you know, have incredible freedom, unseen like before in human history. But at the same time, the increasing household across the West, the dominant household is moving from, it went from extended family to nuclear family. Now it's becoming one person. And, mm. you know, and that's not a slam on people who find themselves living by themselves because many I know who don't want to do that. But the, the kind of trajectory that this leads to, and even in places like Japan and South Korea, which are less, less Western per se, but still following this trajectory, uh, they now talk about loner culture. Um, but then what we're missing is meaning. I think one of the reasons that perhaps before the COVID-19 moment, we saw this reconnection with politics um, was that a lot of our religious impulses we're pushing into politics because we're actually looking for meaning um, or we're looking for it in tribalism. Um, so we were hungry for community. We had too much freedom. And when you've got too much freedom, you become dizzy. So the way I say this is, you know, if you wanted to buy uh, dishwashing detergent um, and you go to the store and if there's just one, just say you live in Bulgaria during the communist period, and it's just one and sometimes it's not there, you're going to be more happier when you've got a choice of three. All right. Mm -hmm. But so that's good. But then when there is 1700 in front of you on that supermarket shelf, you're standing there going, which one do I buy? And actually you get what, what uh, is called uh, Schwartz called uh, choice anxiety. So a lot of the what I call ambient anxiety in our culture that people were struggling with actually was because we had too much freedom, too many options. And we were constantly in our heads trying to work out how to navigate this without any one offering a way forward. Um, I think this is, you're 100% right. I think this is being profoundly disrupted in this moment. And that world was a world where it was shaped by consumerism and even hyper-consumerism, which was all about wants. So not only did it offer you ways to, uh, you know, fulfill your wants, it expanded your wants. I studied advertising. Part of advertising was to help people realize it's a product that they never knew they wanted. We're going to make you want it. And we're going to do that by actually offering you, it's going to make you more glorious. It's going to make you more powerful. It's going to make you more sexually attractive. It's going to make you more, more secure. So Western culture has been generating wants. And I've come to the realization, and I've been, before this happened, I had this sort of moment of self-criticism where I began to just ask the question in the last three years, Mark, what if you're being a chaplain to the kingdom of wants? Whoa. And what if you're doing Christianity for people who want to move to Melbourne and be cool and have all their wants, but they still want to have some meaning. They still want some Jesus, but you're putting a Jesus varnish. And we're offering ways to try and spiritually form them. But the ways that are forming them are not powerful enough to actually undo the much more powerful cultural forming of the kingdom of wants. Where we have flipped to in the last 30 days is we have now moved from a want world to a need world. Matt Stoller, who's a, 
um, economist, he wrote this tweet and it was something like, it was more looking at economics. And he said, he was early on to predicting what would happen with COVID-19. And he said, we're about to head into shortages on the supermarket shelf. I'm looking at this going, I think he's being a bit alarmist. I remember the moment going to the supermarket only a couple of weeks ago with my daughter who's 12 and us walking in, it was like panic in the supermarket. Uh, there's a guy from our church who's the manager of that particular store. I'm going to talk to him. He's ripping open boxes with a box cutter. He's putting up stuff. He's like, this is intense. This guy walks up to us, this American guy. He's like, man, this is like Moscow 1954 when you know they ran out of food. Hmm. And I'm staying there having this conversation. I'm like, my daughter is seeing something I've never seen in my life, which is shortage on the shelves. I never have known a moment where the shelves aren't full. There's more stuff available. And I realized my daughter's going to grow up understanding shortage. Now my grandfather who lived through the Great Depression, he knew shortage. He lived differently. Um, the lady across the road who lives across from us, who's Latvian and lived under the communists and the Soviets, who recycles everything, not because she's a hipster, but because that's, that's how uh, you know, she learned to live. She understands need. Many of us don't understand need. So the pivot for many leaders is so much of our ministry is based around providing services, sometimes religious services, I'm, and I'm, this is, I'm self-critiquing as much as oh, I'm yeah. being here, is... What does it now look like to pivot to people who need, who spiritually need, who don't have a job, who don't know how to provide, who are like, I'm running myself ragged here, doing Zoom meetings with clients to keep my job going while homeschooling my kids, while trying to put a lasagna in the, in the oven all at the same time. Uh, that's a huge fundamental change, which is undermining the secular salvation scheme. People are realizing their mortality and their fragility and that the system is fragile. If I could just add one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a moment just before this happened. We had the Australian bushfires. Yeah. Um, so we had the bushfires. So we had people wearing masks because of the Australian bushfires, which is huge. And our generations passed us Sue, um, uh, we had a number of people at church who went on their summer vacations to the beach and then got, like, they had to be, you know, evacuate. And um, there were people stuck in some towns. And Sue was telling me she was near a town. She had to leave. And the town above her, and this is Australia, where we've got nationalized healthcare. We've got a very good government. We have everything provided for us. We, we didn't even go into recession during the GFC because our government managed it so well. The town that was above where she was at, they ran out of food in 48 hours. There's looting. And I was talking about this, like we just don't think about this with Australia. And I, I, there's a sense where so much of the questioning and spiritual, like I believe that post-Christianity is able to survive when it has a number of social things keeping it in place. When you believe that you know, Amazon's still going to get that parcel to you when you can go to that cafe. You can move to Paris if you want to because the borders are still open. A number of those supporting structures are now starting to collapse or look fragile, and that's going to open up a massive spiritual hunger. Mm. How, that, that is so rich, Mark. How Are there other ways in which our predominant worldview for the last 40, 50 years is being dismantled before our eyes? Are there other threats, other, like, You know, the bubble, because I think you're right. You know, I think of people who are lifestyle entrepreneurs on Instagram or on the internet. And I'm like, wow, that's a tough message right now, man, because the whole thing was based on do what you want, when you want, how you want, with who you want. And I'm like, all of a sudden overnight, that world collapsed. How else is this challenging? And even, I think you're right. Most of us, I mean, you know, I became a Christian in Canadian culture. You became a Christian in Australian culture. Uh, Most of our audience is American. They became Christians in American culture. And it's very difficult to disentangle your worldview from your faith view, uh, but that is being done right now in real time. So any other ways in which some of the core beliefs we may have even thought were Christianity uh, turned out to be cultural? Yeah, I mean, so many. I mean, I'll try and think of a a, a few. Like, um, I think what this is doing is it's, you know, I think there was a fear that when this first happened, like, oh man, everyone's going to go live streaming And this is just going to be a boon to cultural Christians who just want to sit on their couches with a packet of chips and a beer and their tracks, you know, their track pants and just, you know, like, is this the future? I I realize those people, they're not going to watch. Um, Bingo. They're gone. And, and, you know, and I've had to be adaptive, you know, like I wasn't a huge fan, you know, I'm a big embodied person and, you know, like that. But I'm like, man, you've got to adapt, Mark. Like this is now, this is a wartime situation. You're thinking a peacetime situation. Mm. And I actually think those people are disappearing. What I'm seeing is, you know, if you're going to join our live stream, at, at, you know, you actually have to proactively do that because there's a lot of other things on that channel that you can flick across to. And I can and leave without you ever knowing I was there. Yep. You're exactly. Right. Exactly. So I think what's happened is, we've got, like, churches had these three layers. 
up the top is leadership. You know, most of the people listening to this are you know leaders, and and we lead by an example. We cast a vision. We communicate. But then we had this middle rung of um, services and large gatherings where we could get people. You can see who's in the room. You get a sense of what's going on, and you can communicate. Like I, I'm, I'm realizing in Zoom meetings, I can't do a staff meeting like I can do when they're in the room because I can. I mean, I'm a big visual person. I pick up people's emotions and stuff like that. I, I read the context, so it's hard for me. I'm looking at screens and I'm like, is that person? You know, they're looking away. Yeah. Um, so we, but we, so we didn't realize how much leverage we had in large gatherings and services. Um, then down the bottom was households. This is where people live their every days when they leave your big service, when they've had that moment at the end of the service, that transcendent thing, the worship's pumping, there's been a great message. Maybe there's a response. Maybe people are, are buzzing and talking in the shared spaces afterwards. But then they go back to their homes. Now, what the research has been telling us is that's the hardest place to actually get people to follow Jesus in the orderliness of their lives. Um, and, you know, if you look at, say, Dave Kinnaman's, um, um, you know, research around faith in exiles and both, both know Dave, you know, what that's saying is look, just with the emerging generations, but I think this is true of, you know, outside the millennials, is that a large percentage of people sitting in your services are habitual Christians. Yes. who come and they're sitting in your big gatherings and then maybe at, their, your, at your men's conference, maybe they're in your worship service, maybe they're sitting in that seminar, but actually their lives are not reflecting biblical truth. They don't even believe all the things that we would say are really stack standard, just basic Christian stuff. So we could have been getting a false feedback loop where actually we're, oh man, it's the service is packed, brilliant. All these people are coming to my conference, awesome. But then what's happening in their homes? When the doors are shut, who are they when no one's looking at them? How are they talking to each other in their marriages? What are they downloading? What are they doing? How are they cycling their kids? That middle run, that leverage point is gone. Right. And we're, in a sense, flying in the dark. And I know that I had this early warning moment when I was in Malaysia, just as this was, was all hitting, and there was a guy at this conference, and I, I didn't speak to him directly, but I heard this secondhand, and he was from Mongolia, and Mongolia shut down a lot of churches. And and this Mongolian pastor was like, I don't know where my people have gone. We're doing live stream, but I don't know where my people are. And that scared me. As a pastor, I'm like, man, that's real. So a lot of pastors listening to this are probably like, where are my people? I'm, I'm, tr- I'm seeing the stats on YouTube Live or Facebook Live, but who are these people? And where's that guy gone? And where's that family gone? And I realized that what we're actually doing is this, this moment is we're handing across leadership to them. I have lost a bunch of leadership at this point in time. We all have. And that leadership happens in that space. where I can every week, I've got them in a room. I can talk to them. That's gone. And there's a commissioning moment. And I believe God maybe, I don't believe God's called this pandemic, but God, Romans tells us, God uses things for good. I believe that God's going to do a judo move on the work of the enemy here. And that actually part of this could be strengthening those households. Yes. Because now I've got people saying, okay, how do I disciple my kids? How do I do this? Okay, we're now praying because we assumed our jobs were safe. They're not anymore. So I believe that God is doing this this moment in this, this, this time to strengthen those things. So I believe this could be an acceleration which actually subverts cultural Christianity. Now, it's not going to go away, but it could subvert well, let's actually say subvert habitual Christianity. Mm-hmm. The whole consumer thing, that this is a product I totally, consume versus a, something I actually have committed to. Totally, wow. yeah. Mark, I listened to a million things like you have over the last month, and uh, this may have been you, it may not have been, but one of the sources uh, said that the nations who responded best to the crisis so far in terms of being able to eliminate the risk to the virus are often the Asian nations. And for a few reasons, uh, not all of them great. One, authoritarian government. Number two, a high sense of honor. Number three, a deep sense of loyalty to community. And so the government locks you down and you stay in and you don't rebel. And the nations that have had the hardest time with this are the westernized nations, the nations that prize individual freedom because they're like, well, you can't make me stay in or I'm, I'm the exception to the rule. And it's been very interesting to see that play out over the last few weeks in the infection rate and the death rate. And even what I see on social casually, I would say that, yeah, that's not completely unreasonable. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that as it uh, relates to our ethic and how we think of ourselves? Yeah. 
So just give a bit of nuance behind that. So like what we're seeing is there's a cultural memory with SARS that Hong Kong, Singapore, China had. So in a yeah. sense, what we're seeing is the response to that. Um, and I want to, I guess, nuance it that, you know, there's a variety of countries in Asia. Um, Cambodia, for example, is not dealing with this well because their authoritarian government's links to China was denying that it was happening. Um, uh, but what we're seeing is, I would say, countries with a higher level of radical individualism where, hey, man, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Awesome. Now is how, how you behave is no longer this thing of you. You know, there's that whole saying, you do you. <laughs> like, no, no, I don't want you. You do, you know, like you, you live your life how you want it. I do not want people in my neighborhood, you doing you. If you I mean, there was, a, there was a party like about three weeks ago before, like Australia's quite shut down now. And there was a large party I could hear several houses away. And I normally be like, oh, whatever. They're having a few beers, playing the music loud. Hopefully they shut it all off by 11. You know, I'm, I'm on my back porch. I'm like, man, these people need to stop. I'm like, do I ring the police? And I, I'm not because of the noise. Like, this is dangerous now. So we're, what, what this is doing is that the myth of radical individualism where we can just pursue our own wills has now been exposed. That we live in an interconnected world. Like I... You know, for me, it's not even the question of globalization versus anti-globalization. It's the fact as humans, uh, we're intimately connected to the rest of the world. Our lives are connected to others. And this is showing us how that is true. So I would say that nations which have a, a better value on that, um, uh, you know, who are willing to, for the sake of the team, you know, take a hit. Um, but that's not a message that many in, in parts of the West. The other thing I would say, too, is. I wonder where this is going to subvert the West in that we now have Western countries on very different trajectories. Um, I did a Danish podcast um, yesterday, um, and, and Denmark and Australia are actually doing okay because we have a very different political system. And we've talked about the West as this broad category, but now the different. So Sweden and Denmark are going completely different paths. Sweden is like, let's go herd immunity, let's open everything up. Uh, Denmark shut everything down. And Denmark and Sweden, which looked very similar to each other, could look very different in three years. Um, the Can United you drill down Canada, on that a little bit more? Yes. Um, so, for example, Denmark, um, the prime minister there, she shut everything down quite early. Uh, Sweden decided to just let's just keep going. Yeah, I read that about Sweden. Yeah. Basically, you can shop, the kids are going to school, and they're going to try to immunize everyone by spreading the disease, right? Yes. So, so which basically is surprising what that for means, Sweden. Yes, but this is even showing that we look at our oh, Scandinavia, they're all the same. Scandinavia is quite different. You know, when you look at the Danes versus the Swedes, there's actually differences there. And we've sort of known that. But what this is doing, this is, um, this is showing the, the great differences in actual cultures and political systems. So we would say, oh, the West, like I would be on podcasts, always talking about the West. Um, there is significant uh, uh, trajectories that different countries will go on. The United Kingdom early on went for herd immunity. Then they realized the modeling showed that they're going to lose half a million people. They pulled back. Um, but now the United Kingdom is in a really difficult position with the amount of deaths they're having. The United States took a very different tack to this um, than you know what other countries did because of political culture. Canada's taking a different track. And even within countries, Quebec is, I think, you know, closing some of its borders to, to other provinces and you're seeing this really interesting thing where the decisions of your local government now are life and death for you. Yes. So all of a sudden, I'm watching press conferences with our premier. That's a version of our governor. Um, I'm watching that. I watched a press conference with the premier of Tasmania. I would never watch that in a million years before. But I'm like, he's going to shut him. That's the state below us. Like, yeah. what are they going to do? You know, so all of a sudden, what this means is we've become very local. At the same time, we're having this weird internet conversation and if you track this out like australia um you know we're keeping our new infections quite low because we've responded in a particular way you know countries healthcare, countries social welfare schemes there's a bunch of western countries which are paying people now almost the universal basic income um, who have lost their jobs there's other western countries that haven't so that the trajectories forward of those two different paths are mean that the west is going to look very diverse uh, as this plays out in the next few years. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I've been tracking the numbers uh, multiple times a day. And, you know, I spent a lot of time on both sides of the border. I'm a Canadian who spent about a third of my life, sometimes it felt like half in the U.S., just working with leaders. And, you know, I have uh, a green card for the U.S. as well, which is not very actionable right now, but those are other <laughs> stories. Um, 
But I look at us and we have half the infection rate per capita and a quarter of the death rate. And I think part of that is the Canadian government acted about a week sooner and Canadians kind of went, okay, we'll go inside. Whereas if I'm using social media as a measure and the stories I'm reading as a measure in the U.S., it was like, ah, we're going to go to the beach. Now, we still have some of that here, but it's really, really interesting to track. And, you know, one of the other comments I saw is uh, there was no global response. There was a local response. There was supposed to be a global response, but the world leaders did not call each other. They all acted to protect their tribe and whatever they saw best. And even in the U.S., there's 50 different responses. In Canada, there's 10 plus three territories, right? And you have all of your states, which are different, and cities, which are different. Melbourne would be different than Sydney, different state as well. So it's really interesting that we've gone very, very hyper-local, which a year ago I would have said was irrelevant at this point. We are uniculture. Wow. absolutely. So extrapolate a couple of years. What are the implications? Um, So, you know, like what, so the, you know, I saw one thing postulated on Twitter with travel. So, for example, uh, if you look this out, like what happens if Singapore and New Zealand get down to zero with testing or five cases? And then all of a sudden they go, we're going to open flights between us. But then they're going to fly over countries which are red zones. Um, what happens if Canada and Australia actually get OK on this and I can jump back on an Air Canada flight and come and visit you, but I can't stop in Mexico, the United States, because they've still got huge infection rates. Mm -hmm. Um, So you could actually have two levels of countries here. Um, And to take it even further, what happens, say, in the United States, where California has had a shelter in place law longer, um, but then you've got other states which are not doing that at all. And you could have, you know, regional areas where maybe you could go down to California, but you can't go to, you know, Mississippi. Um, so that's going to provide this really weird thing. Now, the, well, the world's gone to that before. If you look, say, the late antiquity or the dark ages, it went very, very local. But we're going to have this weird moment where it's super local. You might not be able to travel. I mean, I, I've read some predictions from people. I started going to, like, airline <laughs> people who predict the airline industry. You know, there's some predictions that we might not see international travel for two to three years. Yeah. Come back like it was. I'm actually now, preparing most of us- for my next two to three years as though it's going to be a fraction of what it has been in the past. Totally. And, and you think about what that means for missions organizations, for, for NGOs. For, you know, it's, that's it's just an absolute game changer. Um, what that means for hub cities as well is going to be a changer. So, for example, we've had hub cities, London, New York, Paris, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Singapore have done well in globalization. Um, and regions haven't done as well because manufacturing then went into the supply chain. But hub cities now, someone put up a tweet the other day saying that no one's meeting in the New York Times building, basically but the quality of the paper hasn't changed. So is there a point where their board of directors go, hang on, we just saved how many millions on this big, you know, flagship building when we could just do this remotely? Or you look at companies going, hang on, we're still, fly- you know, doing stuff and no one's flying around. We saved $2 million on flights. So you could see a move away from hub cities and a more localized thing. But then where we're connecting, like you and I are, still with the world. So super local, but then... Uh, the, someone said it's land and the cloud. <laughs> That's a great metaphor. So you're you're in Box Hill, which, by the way, has great dumplings. I remember from the last time I was there. <laughs> Rowan Dredge took me there, and uh, yes. and uh, I'm in you know north of Toronto. And you're right. Yet yeah, we're hyper connected. I want to get into um, some predictions, and I know these are early days, but when you're looking at trends, it is smart. I think to look ahead as much as you can. But I want to ask you a couple of questions. This one, what's the danger no one's talking about right now? There's got to be some stuff that just is not getting enough daylight that is on your mind or heart. What do you think the danger is no one's talking about? I mean, it's getting a little, um, a little coverage if you look beneath the surface. But, but my concern is that we're seeing a profound reshaping of the global order. Um, you know, I, I see China has done this incredible thing where, you know, there was that series Chernobyl and six, seven weeks ago, everyone's saying, is this Xi Jinping's Chernobyl moment? Now people are saying, is this the Chernobyl moment for Britain or the United States? And China is opening things up again. And um, China is like, well, we can start the supply chain again. Who wants to join into us? Um, and, uh, you know, there's a moment where, you know, you, you look, there's two, I think it's two aircraft carriers that are incapacitated for the United States military with coronavirus outbreaks. You know, there's people looking at this stuff. You're seeing a profound um, Saudi 
uh, Russian oil war happening at the moment. Uh, Turkey is repositioning. Um, there is an element that some authoritarian states can reposition in this moment. And some of the, the that is going with that is that there is a moment where we're going to move to increased surveillance in the world. So one of the ways that we can deal with this is actually through testing. And it could be that, hey, you can come to Australia in 2021 because all of a sudden we come up with a test which says that you're clear, but then your genetic data is on your passport. Yes. Um, you know, there's, there's talk of this. Okay, great. Um, but then well, how is that then used in the future um, you know, going forward? So if you look at, say, um, you know, I read Shoshana Zuboff's book on, um, you know, all the digital stuff and how the surveillance is happening now and how so much of our lives are being bought and sold. But she makes the point that a lot of that happened because there was all these um, restrictions in place about our digital privacy. But then what changed them was 9-11, mm -hmm. when all of a sudden governments were like, hang on, we've got this war on terror, so we need to change the rules a bit here. Um, and if you look at how the world changed for 9-11, how that changed travel, you look at TSA in the United States, you look at biometric passports, you know, we started putting our fingers down when we you know, got to a customs desk. Um, that will now move to biology. Um, now, the interesting thing as well is that um, you know, N.T. Wright said something really interesting the other day. He said, what Christians in the West who are experiencing this don't realize is pandemics are a normal part of human history. Yes. And, uh, you know, I was on a podcast with um, Justin Brilli and, and uh, there's an expert on there around virology. And, and, and she was speaking about, you know, like we've had, this is SARS 2.0. You know, so basically the Spanish flu 2.0 is coming. Mm. Um, this, won't, this will not be the first one that this is coming. And someone put up on Twitter the other day, like there was a 2017 Time magazine about the next pandemic. There's the Bill Gates, you know, TED talk about, hey, this is coming. Um, you know, there's that term a black swan, which is an event that no one predicts. And Nicholas Nassim Taleb, who coined the term black swan, actually said, this is not a black swan because we knew this was coming. The experts were telling us we just didn't prepare. It's, not, it's only a black swan if you don't see it coming. So I think you'll see biosecurity as an increasing part of life. But biosecurity with increased surveillance. You know, I was reading that um, China is um, getting some of its, they have these free enterprise types or these zones of trade in some of the countries like Cambodia and so on. They were now sort of saying to the workers in those places, hey, we want to get you to sign a form that is saying that you're not going to gather in religious gatherings because religious gatherings are transmitters of this thing. Can you please sign this form? Wow. There was an op-ed here in Australia which was basically saying, um, you know, because the outbreaks, the outbreak in, in New York State was from a synagogue. The outbreak in Iran was from the religious city of Qom. There was uh, in France and Switzerland, it came from a charismatic megachurch conference. Um, there is a case that I've heard some people in an op-ed making like, hang on, we've got to now regulate how people gather. So I'm concerned that, you know, some of the pushback we could see from particular authoritarian regimes who are now looking to influence things beyond their borders um, in an international world, that that could grow. That's one thing I'm concerned about. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, we may be at the uh, stage at some point, I don't know why these thoughts pop into your head, but next time you get on a plane, you get your temperature taken before you're allowed to board, things like that, that, you know, they do the little forehead scan and away you go. Well, uh, we could talk at the meta level all night, all day. Uh, I want to switch because you're also leading a church and your Rebuilders podcast is a beautiful oscillation between the hyper theoretical and the hyper practical. And you got a lot of church leaders, a lot of business leaders listening who are trying to figure out, yeah, I am working from home. My kids are hanging off me. I'm trying to run a remote organization. Nothing prepared us for this. You've got a few pillars that you're using at your church to help guide you through this. Can you just share what those are briefly for leaders? Yeah. So, so we just sort of came, I felt like we need, there's so much information that we just need a few pillars to, to, to gather around. And so I just came up with four, um, which was the first one was adapt. Mm. Um, when you hit a crisis, you often double down on what you were doing before. And I realized this is a profound change moment. Um, I think I've studied culture enough to know, like, you know, this is a big, this is a watershed moment. So we have to adapt. Um, and there's adapting in terms of lots of people had to go completely online, but then there's also the adapting in your thinking, you know, as well. You know, who's going to be making the decisions? If you look, uh, Australia currently has effectively what is like a wartime cabinet 
the government in parliament is not meeting as usual. They enacted a new type of leading. Um, so we need to adapt how we lead. We need to uh, adapt. But the game of adapting must flow from you adapting how you're mentally responding to this reality. And strategy flows from that. Um, uh, the second thing we realize is that there's a tremendous kingdom of God moment to protect. Uh, that the next thing we had was protect. How do we protect people? The decisions that you make of chancing it, um, of like, I oh, will see how that goes. So there's, there was one moment where I've got one staff member who is just on a day a week and, and um, the rest of the time he works in a hospital. And we had this conversation in the car park and he, he essentially was saying to me, Mark, um, you know, I realize I'm about to probably get dragged into this frontline battle in ICU. Um, you know, like, like in a sense, will you release me into that? You know, and it was quite sort of this emotion. Uh, he would sort of hit me for our frontline um, medical people. Um, you know, and I was just asking him questions. And he said, there was some question where I had like, oh, this person's coming in. Is it okay? If they, this was early days. If they're not feeling well, is that okay? And he said, Mark, in the medical world, we don't presume there's a maybe. It's either this person definitely doesn't have something or we're going to do everything to protect you that you probably do have it. And that flipped my thinking. Like wow. pre-pandemic thinking is like, oh, maybe. Oh, let's give it a week. Let's think about it. Let's be cautious. This is like go hard and go early. So you got to go hard and go early to protect your people. Um, so protection now becomes this key pillar. I think the church is called to protect the vulnerable. Yeah. And we're so used to doing that in an embodied sense. But what if the biggest gift is the kingdom of God is actually to not go out your front door at the moment? It's so bizarre, but, you know, like to protect people from infection. Can you drill down a little more on that? Because there was that one weekend in March where for a lot of leaders listening, it was discretionary. You could open, you could not open. And there was still a lot of denial, like this is overblown. More people die of the flu than are going to die from COVID. Come on, what is this? You can't do my liberty. We decided to close physical locations and go digital. I believe you made the same decision. Can you explain why, in your view, it's important for leaders to go first in the name of protecting and actually be more cautious? Yes. I think, I think the first thing is, I, I, to be honest, it was in a phone call with my dad. Mm -hmm. um, so we were like, maybe we could go ahead. This is coming. I thought I had seen it earlier because I'd been in, in Singapore uh, sorry, in, in Malaysia, you know, and they were doing like the testing on heads when you're going to certain buildings, the temperature, they were doing these sort of, is it HEPA, I think, or like, you know, these like infrared cleansing of things. So I'd, I'd had an early sense of where this was going to go. But we were like, oh man, maybe we meet next week. And just, I just realized how much as leaders, we, you don't want to be reactive and impulsive, you know. And um, I, I had this conversation with my dad where my, my parents are in their 70s. Both my, my, my parents have had some health issues. And my dad rang me and he said, look, I just want to, he comes to our church and said, look, Mark, I just want to let you know, we've made the personal decision. We've been wrestling with this all week. Um, you know, we know you probably will meet this Sunday, but we've decided we can't meet um, because we've just got to protect our thing. And, and for me, that was when it was real. It went from like, I'm like, hang on, you've been wrestling this all week. And, and then I began to hear the stories of, hey, I mean, like younger people who may have asthma or people with heart conditions who are wrestling. And I just thought, I can't do this. Like, I can't. Like, there are people looking like at me as a leader. Like, I'll come, Mark, if you think this is okay. Like, and at that moment, it wasn't just like, oh, let's just see how this plays out. Like, I had to err on the side of hyper caution. Mm. And I thought about it. I thought, I go a week early. And you know what? Some people think I'm, I'm reactive. So what? Yep. We do one service where we're on online, we're on YouTube. What do I lose? You know, someone thinks I'm, you know, and someone, I put, you know, I had people online like, oh, you're overreacting. This is crazy. But imagine, you know, like there was a church in Sydney which met that week and there was an outbreak, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, imagine if, if you lost people at, at your church. Like, I just thought, this is different. So I realized there was a different strategic decision making. Um, and I think we said it off air before, like there was that Nicholas Nassim, I think it was Nicholas Nassim Taleb quote where he said, um, in a, in a crisis, it's better to panic a little early than panicking when you realize that you didn't panic early enough. Yes. And you know, I just thought, I, I read that. I thought, okay, well, that's it. Or we're 100%. not going this week, guys. And um, I'm always, yeah. you know, what was so paradigm shifting for me is I'm the guy who never cancels. I'm the guy who, if the roads are open, we're open. I've never, I'm talking to Australia going, guy's name is Phil, super leader. I'm like, I never cancel. I've never canceled anything, but you know, and he was there a day later. It was just the time zone difference between our countries. And 
That was so bizarre for me to be pulling out and to think I'm being unfaithful. Like I just don't have enough faith, but it's it's a big flip in a crisis that none of us have been through before. Okay, so that's number two, protect. Number three? Um, yeah, so the, the, the next one was respond. Yeah. How do we respond at this point of time? So like, how do we respond in this moment? How do we be the hands and feet of Jesus? So in a sense, the landscape has changed and how we were responding six months ago is not how we respond now. All of a sudden, we've got people who are going to lose jobs. We've got people who are going to be isolated. You know, how do we as a church respond? We've adapted, but now how do we respond to the new need that's going to be in our midst? The last one was lead. I realized that wartime leadership is completely different to peacetime leadership. Um, Winston Churchill, for all his faults, and you could write a books on it, and I'm not saying he's the ultimate leader to look to, but what was interesting is Churchill was a wartime leader who basically got, you know, lost the job once Britain went into peace. There are certain types of people who, who, you know, strange times often create strange leaders. And so I realized that I had to lead differently. I had to lead my team differently. That more now was about spiritual authority. The messages that people wanted to hear were different. Uh, I just noticed that podcasts, uh, I saw some stats that podcasts are radically dropping because people are not multitasking um, at the moment in listenership. But what's gone up is any podcast which helps you deal with with coronavirus is going up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I realized that. It's, so there's an element. We had to refit our delivery mechanisms around just being online. But then I also had to not just change the delivery content. I had to change the content. Yes. Uh, you know, and it was a d- totally different form of communication that needed to happen. So how do we then lead and lead with spiritual authority in this moment? With them, you know, there's messages now that look trite from yesterday. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. And look, you know, I, I just there was one moment where I saw it was a moment when it's like everyone was realizing like half the world had realized and half the world hadn't and this is honestly not a slam on this person but I was like looking at my Instagram you know like it has like the little stories of different people and and you know there were leaders like speaking into it and there was this this leader who was just doing some sort of funny thing or something and I just saw this and I just thought man that that like it's like that is the past era yes and that's not to say fun will go away but you know as as you're being bombed in the blitz you know, there's certain messages that you don't give. Then people want to hear the leader, you know, we'll fight them on the beaches speech at that point in time. I think that was a really good framework. And I think what uh, one of the things I appreciate about your voice, appreciate about your voice is it's beautifully theoretical and yet hyper-practical because you got a real church you're leading. Uh, I want to ask you about weekend services. So in many ways, we're kind of programmed to broadcast and we have this weekend event how do you think weekend services or our digital ministry is going to be different from simply live streaming what used to happen in a room on Sunday? Um, that's fluid as we speak. So we're recording this just to timestamp uh, this interview at the beginning of April. So by the time it comes out in a couple of weeks, we pivoted our whole podcast to, to just deal with the crisis leadership because you're right. people That's what people want to hear about. So appreciate you making yourself available. But um, so as of April 2nd, when we're recording this, how how are you pivoting your services or have you done that or what have you seen that makes you think, huh, this could be the future? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Like what, One theory I've had is that it's so weird because we've gone hyper-local. So the global travel network is now hyper-local. But then we've also got this internet network, you know, and, you know, the great Canadian Marshall McLuhan, um, you know, spoke about this this new stage that will come where basically we'll be communicating across frontiers and essentially called it the global village. So it's weird. Like we're, hope, we're in our village, but then we've got the global village. And we've also got this church global village. And what I saw fascinating happening over the first weeks of this was there was the panic. But then often, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Hmm. And I saw people learning from each other. I'm texting, oh, what did you guys do? Are you pre-recording your sermons? Are you doing them live? Hang on, we're doing this prayer thing. Oh, we're using Zoom in this way. And what I saw was uh, this crowd sourcing moment, this crowd, uh, you know, and I, I came up with this line, so the next renewal is going to be crowdsourced because we're all going to be watching and learning together as we're scrambling, which creates a, an, an urgency and importance. So many great inventions actually come in wartime because people just have to take these risks. So I believe that, I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but I do notice that there is a greater need for leadership. People are wanting to be led. Just I'll see you on Sunday and then I'll get along with my life and catch you next Sunday. That's changing. 
Um, I was talking to a friend um, just uh, in Europe, and he was saying he's shocked because he was doing the morning, the Sunday service, and then he's doing this midweek thing, which is literally him in a lounge chair with a glass of wine, teaching from scriptures and praying for people. And he's like, that's getting heaps more hits than the Sunday service. Like, how do I process this? You know, so, you know, I, it's interesting. When, when John and Charles Wesley's Wesleyan renewal happens, a lot of that began when they switched to this new reality that people had been stuck in this parish system where they stayed in place and they had the service, almost always Anglican in that context in Britain, and they had the Sunday sermon. And then they discovered that the tumult of the Industrial Revolution where people were moved and social life was disrupted, that they were actually looking for something midweek. So the beginnings of the, the uh, Methodist you know, renewal happened when they actually started these midweek societies and they would preach, but then people would get into small groups and pray and keep each other to accounts. So that was actually driven by this adaptation that happened because of this new social environment. So I, I, I predict that prayer is coming to the forefront in new ways. I'm seeing churches doing online prayer in ways I've never seen before because that's what, in the, from the want, prayer goes from an option to a need. Um, so I think we're actually going to see almost the more whole of week. I, I was for 10 years with the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army had, had a whole variety of events that would happen during the week for people who were trying to find a new social fabric because they're coming out of addiction or they're coming out of extreme poverty in, in you know, 19th century Britain. I just think, I don't know what, exactly what it's going to look like, but I think you're right that we're going to see a really different landscape of what we're offering people from, hey, if we can get you for an hour on Sunday and get you to your kid's football game, we've done well, to now all that stopped. So there's this moment of attention. I do think there is an end point to this. Like there is a moment when the vaccine will arrive and, and life will come back to normal. So I think there's a purpose, but I think there's a deepening that will happen in this time. But it's, yeah, it's fascinating watching it all happen. Yeah. Do you think we have been too Sunday focused in our model in the past? Y- yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Long and short, yes. Um, I mean, the biblical imagination of faith is a whole of life place. The Jewish tradition speaks of the family home as a temple. The New Testament language of us being living temples, that your individual life is a temple where you can meet with the presence of God, that your home is meant to be a temple, that these families on mission with God are temples. And I do believe, like I still am a, I can't wait to be back in a gathered room with a bunch of people. I love that, you know, but you know, I think that what we do is we, we neglected those other spaces where the New Testament says that the glory of God can dwell just as it dwells once in the temple. There's a moment here where I think that perhaps we've lost our platforms to get the presence back in those places. Ooh, that's a strong word. That's a powerful word and a convicting word. It's amazing how everything just ground to such a screeching halt. And the conversation this week is, I don't know what to do with my staff. Like, you know, there was a facilities person. How are you grappling with that right now at your church when you think about how you used to mobilize people, volunteers and staff, versus perhaps what we're looking at over the next few months before things get back to some new normal? Yeah. It was really helpful talking to my friend um, who, he lived in Beijing during SARS when it first came. Ah, and I said, Look, what was it like? Yeah. So I was, yeah. So I was like, hey, what was it like? And he said, it was six weeks of like panic and and fear, and then it was just this ongoing drudgery and boredom. So I thought this is going to be interesting. There's going to be a period where we're all scrambling, people are buying toilet paper and in two bulk, you know, and you know that's going to happen with my team. So I thought like I have to, what I need to be careful is don't let the first six weeks then define you. So in a sense, I was just like, let's get meeting, let's just see how things are, but then let's we need to prepare for that next long. I think it will be a long season. It could be up to eighteen months where perhaps we're sort of in shelter in place and then going out of it and coming back. So I didn't want to set my staff team and reposition them for the panic period. Yeah, uh, I, need, I needed to, to set them for what this will look like in the long term. So I did notice a division between content production and response. Uh, so I realized that as a leader, because I don't have the people in the room, there's a really important thing for me to lead. And almost, I began to see it in this really interesting way. It's almost like, it was funny. Like I was watching, I was watching um, 
I thought I'm, gonna, I'm sick of the coronavirus. I'm just going to watch something that's different, you know. And look, I like politics. There's a there's the dramatized. Um, I think it's BBC production of Brexit: The Uncivil War with Benedict Cumberbatch. And I'm watching this and to distract myself. And then they talk about you know how do you campaign? How do you reach voters? There's this definite day of election day when a decision is going to be made. And as I'm watching this, I'm like, hang on, I must feel like this now. It's like, I don't know who the voters are out there. Do I trust the polling? You know, who's watching our live stream, those stats? But do I trust the polling? What, what's happening out there? I felt like more like a campaign manager than I felt like <laughs> a pastor. And I'm watching this and I thought, yeah, there'll be a point where when on that first Sunday back, that when that night breaks, I think when the spiritual night, dawn will come. Yeah. How do I want my people to come back? I want them to come back stronger. So as a leader, I'm almost now like a, a politician going, here's the campaign platform. At this moment of night, go deeper. This is a moment where we've lost the service. We're commissioning you to build stronger households. So my sort of slogan I'm saying is, if we're in a campaign, what's my slogan? My slogan is, when the dawn finally breaks and the pandemic is broken and we gather in that room, come back stronger. Come back as stronger in love with Jesus. Come back with a stronger household where maybe your family didn't take faith that seriously, where you're now praying with your kids, where you're praying in your marriage. Maybe you live by yourself. And actually, instead of seeing that as loneliness, you see that as an invitation into dwelling with God and actually solitude. How do we actually come back stronger where we have a greater heart for the world? We're actually the non-Christians who are jumping onto live streams now. They actually join us on that first Sunday back. So I realized with my team, I need to sort of have a response we were out there praying with people where we're providing a bag of rice for someone who's in, in isolation, where we're dealing with the pastoral anxiety that people have lost the job, there's response. But then there's how do we then always have a campaign team to get that message out that here's, here's what we want you to build in this time. Here's our policy statements. But we're trusting you, the voters, <laughs> to turn up on election day and to step into the invitation to actually come back strong. That is a fascinating metaphor, and it really resonates. Mark, as, uh, as we kind of wind down, I want to ask you, and these are very early days, and I realize everything can change in a heartbeat, but as you're looking at the meta trends, as you're looking at the disruption that this crisis has caused, when you think about getting to the other side, what are you seeing and what should leaders be watching for? I think there's there's three three things. I think number one, there's going to be profound change in the world. Yes. Um, I think, as we said, there's going to be divergent for different countries. Um, uh, we are not just in a pandemic; we're also in a profound economic challenge. Uh, the world was already in a significantly economic trouble that that we were at almost negative interest rates around the world. The global economy was not growing, and really, economists don't know what to do about that. Um, we had created demand in these areas like travel and cafes and almost this creative class that Richard Florida talked about. That's gone now. Entertainment, sports, gone. Um, so we're going to you know, face possibly a hard recession or a global depression, which could last longer than the pandemic. Um, and that's going to change things. I think that the countries, once you've been infected, like there's an element where we're not going to, the borders won't open up necessarily once the pandemic stops. There's going to be a lot of fear out there and I don't know what that looks like. So we're going to be in a profoundly changed world. Um, technology, I think, will change things. The second thing is that a lot won't change. Hmm. We're already seeing, you know, there's a few weeks of panic and, um, uh, you know, a lot of the politicians are just doubling down on their platforms already and just trying to work a list around it and there's still polarisation in certain places. My brother just sent me this really fascinating picture of two girls in Sydney, which is absolutely deserted at Opera House, which is normally, I was there oh, yeah. you know, earlier this year, packed with tourists, utterly deserted. But there's two teenage girls and one's posing and the other's taking a selfie of her. Um, <laughs> I thought, man, some of this stuff's just going to keep continuing. The radical individualism is still going to be here. post christianity is still going to be here. Political madness is still going to be here. Um, so there's some things that will change radically, other things that won't change. What my big hope for is... After we come out of a crisis, there's a sense in us to go back to normal. Mm. My big hope is that there, God was already preparing a people before. Renewal always springs from people who go through a personal crisis. There was a bunch of people who'd gotten to the end of themselves. Martin Lloyd Jones said, Revival follow, flows from men and women who've gone to the end of themselves. That was already happening with a bunch of people. Like, man, I'm, I'm doing this 21st century radical individual thing, and it just gives me no meaning. And I'm now praying more than I ever prayed before. I, I was meeting people around the world in the last two years, many who don't have a platform, who are in hidden places. I'm like, God's preparing you for something. So God has been preparing. 
Um, but that is now just accelerated. And I believe there's going to be a remnant in the global church who at this moment are actually going to learn the lesson, step into the invitation, um, and they're going to come back with a tenacity of faith, a spiritual resilience. They're going to learn things where they commune with God in the hidden places, where they dwell in his word, where they learn to pray, where they learn to sit in God's presence, listen to him, where they actually place their sufficiency in him. Um, I believe that in places like Canada and Australia and Scandinavia, where we've looked at this inevitable trajectory of post-Christianity, that actually God is going to renew his church. Post-Christianity will still be there. There'll be still strange things. But my hope is that when dawn breaks, that actually the church is going to come back stronger. Uh, that's what I'm going to be working with all my energy that I have in this mm. moment to not just make my church survive, but in the crisis, actually the global church thrive. Can I ask you a question then about uh, digital? Do you think it will go back to the way it was before this broke? Or do you think it'll be this seamless stream between digital and physical gatherings or any thoughts on that, Mark? I think, I think there'll be two things. I think we're going to see a normalization of certain elements of um, digital stuff. You know, it could be that, you know, I look at, you know, hey, do I fly to the United Kingdom um, and have a bunch of meetings? And then I go, I can, for free, I can do that on Zoom. So I think those questions are going to happen. I think a lot of churches will stay on live stream because what they're already discovering is they've tripled in attendance. And you know, I just heard from someone who was saying, you know, there's friends next door who never come to church, never, ever, didn't want to come to church. And then they tell them, oh, we just jumped on your live stream. So we're going to discover that dynamic of, I think, a, a harvest that we're going to connect with. I do note too that sort of scarcity creates value. Mm-hmm. Um, it does. I love I love football. I love soccer, and um, it's really interesting. So you know, I've been like, you know, well, what does it mean? There's no games, and I jump on like when I'm trying to distract myself or in free time, I jump on you know sports forums, and just there's just guys in there, just like man, like you know, I didn't go to every game, but when the first game's back, I am there. I miss it. Like I miss being in a stadium. I miss church. And after faith, I just want to be in a stadium with fans and that experience, which I can still get on TV. Now, will I be at every game? Probably not. I'll watch some on the TV later. And I can now have incredible streaming where I can download the English Premier League and watch it in high definition on my on my TV, you know, when I on my day off on Monday after a preached or Sunday. I still love that. But I'm also going to be at games. Yeah. Chanting and, and standing and, and cheering because I profoundly miss that. So I actually think what we're going to see is we're going to see people realize that what community, the importance of it now that it's disappeared. I think the gathering will have a profound, there's an element like I'm preaching to a camera, but I deeply miss that human feedback loop and that interaction, that sense where you're feeling something (laughs) in the room and the Holy Spirit's moving. And and so I think technology will continue to increase, but it's not going to be, everyone's just going to be watching TV on their couches. Any sense of, uh, you know, I think of three categories of churches. Uh, Some will thrive, some will survive and kind of crawl to the other side, and then some may not make up, make it rather. Any sense of what the differentiators might be between those three categories, or perhaps you have different categories, but I think some may not make it. Some will just limp to to the new normal, and then some will actually grow and expand and flourish. Yeah, I think I think the big key is adapt, adapt, adaptivity. Adaptive, those churches which are adaptive, um, you know, crisis seeds new things. Um, crisis, you know, it's a cliche, but the classic, you know, thing of the Chinese character of crisis is also opportunity. Um, you know, I think real strategy is actually seeing what's happening. Uh, you know, there's fascinating little thing. And Bruno Marqueshu wrote a book um, about you know the transfer of from a Western world to, he called it this Eurasian world. Right. And there's a bit where he's talking to these Chinese thinkers. He's, a, he's Portuguese, European. And he's, the Chinese thinker says to him one day, you guys think about in the West strategy as, here's your goal, here's how do I get there? And you plan it out. Then if something comes against that, you're like, oh man, my, my, my strategy is falling apart here because something happened which is stopping me getting to my idealized goal. And this guy says to him, in China, what we do is we look at what's the field of play, what's happening, and how do we take advantage of that? And there's this element where I think that's the kind of leadership which is going to now flourish. The people who look at this and go, I'm not just going to try and do the same thing. Yes, I'm still orientated to the kingdom of God, to preaching the gospel, to growing the global church, to responding to God. But I'm also adaptive. And I think the churches that adapt to this particular period, but also use them to 
sow seeds of renewal for when we come out of this period, I think they're the churches which are going to which are going to thrive in this time. I think I'm really going to hang on to that up. metaphor. hadn't hadn't heard that. That's good. What is one question no one is asking that you think we should be asking? I feel like at a moment like this, we as a global community have been our eyes are on this. It's a one issue world. Um, I, I have Reuters as an app on my phone. It's news. So it sort of oh, like yeah. just gives me the most, you know, and it's just amazing. And what I love about it is you normally have all these different stories. This is happening in Africa here. It's just, you look at it, just scroll down. Coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. So we've got the world's attention. So our eyes are outward. But I think the question not many leaders are asking is what does God want to do inside of you at this time? You know, one of my big mantras I've learned as a leader from my mentor, Terry Walling from Leadership Breakthrough is, you know, personal renewal precedes corporate change. And we're all scrambling, scrambling to change our churches and how we respond to COVID-19 and all of this, you know, stuff. But I look at leaders and as I read leaders' biographies of the great men and women of God, there's always this crisis moment that's hit. You know, I think of Ignatius Loyola, who created the Jesuits, who was this playboy, so much freedom, going out around Europe, you know, enjoying life, gets hit by a cannonball, ends up in a cave and has this cave experience. So in the midst of this, I, you know, I feel like God's saying to me, Mark, you can run around like a headless chicken here and respond, 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 but I want to do something in you. And so I actually believe that there is this point where that, that leadership I've lost, where I'm having to hand it across to other people, there's a space there. And the question in this is, yet there's a pandemic. There could be a, a global recession. But leader, I feel God is saying, I've got your attention for a while. Mm-hmm. There's a hidden place I want to invite you into. That space where David is anointed in the wilderness before he has the platform. <laughs> and that hidden place is where the Psalms come from. That's where he beats the wild beast so he can actually beat Goliath. I think God is actually touching a bunch of leads back to the hidden place. Maybe they were there many years ago. But how do I get back to that hidden place and reconnect with God in the midst of this global disruption? Mark, wow. Anything else? I mean, this has been so rich. We've covered so much. Yeah, I, I just would love to say to people um, that there is this invitation in this moment. Um, you know, I, I feel like a little bit foolish in that I was pressing into renewal. And there was this moment where I was, I was Pete Gregg, um, who's a friend, is the head of 24-7 prayer in the UK, pastor at Emmaus Road. And we were driving through the English countryside with my wife, Trudy, and, and Pete, and we're talking about renewal. And he just made this comment. I don't even know if he remembers it, where he said, like, I promise I've looked at renewal. So we're talking about, could there be renewal in the West, revival, awakening? And he said, the problem is when I look at history, there's always some tragedy or crisis. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it's like individuals. Let's, in the let's West get there without it, right? <laughs> yeah, like how do I, I, I look back and I think that's actually what I was thinking. Here's this once in a probably century disruption, the biggest disruption since World War II. You are living through it as a leader. There was this one moment where when we decided to go live stream and I was with my team who are mostly millennials and it was the creative guys. That's who the only guys could be in the room. And you know, we had this moment and, and we prayed and we'd been rehearsing all Saturday. Like we went all Saturday, get ready for Sunday morning. We're all Saturday. And then we were ready on Sunday morning and we were praying. And there was this intensity in prayer I'd never seen in them. Like it was like, this is their battle finally. They have like a cause, you know. And we finished the rehearsal and this line came out of me. I said, okay, the rehearsal's done. But perhaps in more ways than one. What if everything up to now has been a rehearsal? What if everything that we've been living in our leadership journeys up to this moment is actually been preparing people for this moment? What if this is now the moment where God wants to do something? He's disrupted. He's got the world's attention. He's frozen people in place. And we have this incredible technological ability that Apostle Paul would have killed for to project our message to the world, to show Jesus' love, to, to seed and lead and, and speak vision um, so my encouragement for leaders at this moment feeling a frightened, scared, loss of control is step into this moment. This, what if this is actually in the midst of the suffering and the pain and the economic dislocation and the medical pain? What if in the midst of this, in this dark cloud, Psalm 18 says, God comes wrapped in dark clouds with lights, light, the bolts of lightning, but the brightness of his presence 
is in that cloud? What if it step into the cloud, see the brightness of God's presence? This is an incredible moment. God wants to do something. Step into it. Mark, it's been so rich. Um, you are writing and uh, doing a lot of things right now that I know leaders are going to want to track with. So where's the easiest places to stay current with you right now? Oh, look, probably just, um, yeah, just go to marksayers.co um, and then you can see it links to yeah, the podcast. And mm-hmm. um, and the podcast where you're, you're podcasting the crisis is called Rebuilders. Yes. And yes, this Rebuilders. cultural moment will return. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mark, what a gift. I can't thank you enough. Thank it's been you. such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Mark Sayers. If you want more, Mark is the pastor of Red Church in Melbourne, Australia. He is also an author of numerous books. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe. And if you prefer audio, often we share this on the Connexus Church audio podcast as well. So subscribe to Connexus Church audio or video. Thanks so much for watching and thanks so much for listening.